Welcome to issue four of the Motivision Roundup. We've had a lot of fun putting it together, and we hope you enjoy what we're going to bring you. We start off with round three of the Outdoor Nationals in the USA at the Glen Helen Raceway. From there, we moved on to the Everts Tortelli battle and the doubleheader at Fox Hills in the UK, and what a day it was. From there, on to Slovenia and the 125, it was the Italians yet again. Regrettably, the British riders were still playing catch-up, but they've got a little time, and maybe they can do it. From there, it was on to the Czech Republic and the 500s, Shane King doing it all correctly. From there, we moved on to San Marino, and the Battle Royal commenced again, before moving on to the Dutch 500 GP, and then finally to the AMA Supercross for the showdown. From Glen Helen Raceway near San Bernardino, California, it's round three of the AMA Motocross Series. Art Ekman, David Bailey, and Davey Coombs bringing you the action as we take a look at the Suzuki point standings. Ricky Carmichael by 23 points over the veteran Honda of Troy rider Michael Craig. Always fast Michael Craig as we take a look at the Suzuki track map now. One unusual factor, they start off the cement here. Right, and just like uh, the round two in Hangtown, the track will be running the opposite direction. And uh, as you can see, there's a lot of uh, switchbacks. So you've got a couple of hills here that are bigger than any hills I've ever seen on a motocross track. Certainly going to be exciting for the fans here at Glen Helen. Always warm in this part of the country, and the dust will be flying on that track. You can believe that as the 125 riders getting ready now for moto number one. Steve Lampson, the defending two-time champion who won one of the two motos here last year, not at the line. And the injury to Lammy's thumb looks serious enough that the uh, chances for a repeat are slim. There you see the concrete slab they start off of. A little different starting technique. We're underway with moto number one of the 125s from Glen Helen Raceway. Let's see who gets the whole shot. Looks like number seven, Kevin Windham. Damon Huffman, number 17, right there with Casey Johnson and Craig Decker. So it's all Kawasaki's behind our leader on the Yamaha, Kevin Windham. Looked like Damon Huffman actually had the whole shot, but he had to make a little sharper corner. Wyndham just left it wide open, carried his momentum around the outside, and now he enjoys a great lead. Huffman, number 17, a 125 Supercross champion in third place. Seems weird to me to see Huffman on a 125. He's been around so long, had so much success in the Supercross on a 125. It kind of seems like he's outgrown this class, but really when you look at it with injuries and having some problems with that bike last year, he hasn't put together a full season. Here's Carmichael to the inside, making the pass on Decker. So Carmichael, after passing Pingree, has already moved on Decker. That was unbelievable. He just gassed it out of that corner from the top of the hill, just charged down the inside right through the holes. Front end did a little dance. Look at him coming down the hill. Bike's dancing all around. It's just hard to get stopped at the bottom of those. And oh, Damon Huffman goes down. Bad break for the veteran. Looks like his front wheel may not have got into that berm. Carmichael going for the double. We saw Wyndham do it. No one else has been able to do that yet. Ali Seymour, oh, look at the look on his face. Kevin Wyndham has something wrong with that bike because he's losing time. Wyndham must have pointed down to it as he went by. There's Chad Watts, Carmichael's mechanic. Boy, he's excited too. So something definitely is wrong with Wyndham's bike as we take a look at Casey Johnson being approached by number 70, Ricky Carmichael. This is the battle for second place. Here's Ricky Carmichael coming down Mount St. Helens against Casey Johnson. Johnson to the inside. Carmichael whips it to the outside. This is going to be an interesting uh, choice of where. Oh, my goodness. Carmichael just leaps over Johnson and hangs on to the position. Carmichael puts the throttle down. Ricky Carmichael with a gutsy move flying by Johnson. Right now, it looks like Carmichael's riding over his head. I know he's not, but it, it looks that way because he's charging into the corners, just hitting whatever line he ends up in and pulling it off just with sheer strength. But a great pass at the bottom of St. Helens. He went way wide. Now you can see how close they're getting to Wyndham, so it does look like Wyndham's got a problem. Looks like Wyndham's lost some power for some reason or other because Ricky Carmichael just shoots by him, as does Casey Johnson. It's going to be interesting to see once they come back around to the mechanics area if they pull Wyndham in. That must be the problem. That makes sense. He could have uh, smashed that pipe and lost a lot of horsepower. So Allie 
is getting ready now for a change once Wyndham comes back around. In the meantime, number 70, Ricky Carmichael, starting to pull the lead on Casey Johnson in second place. Scott Sheik has moved into third. And there's Decker moving in front of Wyndham with Pingree right behind him. That's got to be the problem. Wyndham looks fine. He just looks like he has no horsepower. Everyone's just riding right around him. Wyndham almost went down trying to get out of the way of David Pingree. Now he's just probably trying to figure out what's going to be the fastest way to pull over here and get this done. There's Bob Oliver on the right. Ali Seymour, of course, getting right to work on it. Bob Oliver telling him, hit the kill button, kill it. Something you don't see very often. Look at these guys working frantically. Kevin just doesn't know what to think right now. Just watching this title slip away. Alley getting burned by that hot pipe. You saw how bent up it was. Obviously, a rock came up and really smashed it. A rock can just come off the front wheel. You can pick one up. Could have been a rider in front of him. It's hard to say. It, I, don't, I, would, I don't imagine it was a rider in front of him. It's too early in the race. He hadn't worked his way into lappers yet. Suzuki stopwatch here on the pit stop, you might say. And, oh, look at that. They've got him ready to go. Amazing time. Sheik going wide. Casey Johnson avoiding the ruts to the inside and closes the door on Scotty Sheik. Sheik looking a lot better than he did in this Supercross season, that's for sure. Well, that was an aggressive move right there. Oh, yeah. Scotty Sheik. Casey Johnson going at it. It's Sheik going out in front. Here's Stefan Roncata, the Frenchman, who really had a wonderful Supercross first year. But in motocross, he's having his problems as he looks back. Tim Ferry, the Eastern champion in Supercross, who won that title without a win, moves in front of Stefan Roncata. Ferry really got out of the blocks very, very slow in motocross. The Outdoor Nationals, he didn't score a point on what might be considered his home track at Gatorback. Coming down the hill, what a gutsy move we've got going here. Michael Craig. His mechanic, you saw him earlier, erasing the board saying, do not follow, and he makes the move on Michael Brandis. Michael Brandis, number 33, is getting another pursuer, and it looks like Greg Decker. Brandis seemed like the man on the move a little earlier. Up, ah, goes wide right there, leaves the door wide open for Decker. I don't think he realized Decker was that close, but he, just by looking at the posture right now, the two riders, it looks to me like Decker's the one that's uh, feeling a little bit better at this point in the race. This is when you start to get a little tired, and that may be catching Brandis. Ricky Carmichael, a very impressive debut. His first full season of motocross, Carmichael the Checkers. <laughs> The massive field is underway for moto number two of the 125s. All of Kawasaki's getting a pretty good start, it looks like. Brock Sellers, he gets his first hole shot, but not for long. Ricky Carmichael overtakes the lead in turn two. Carmichael just blitzed by him. Nails that berm and heads up the hill, so he'll see the same thing he saw in the first moto, a clear track. So Carmichael looking to sweep this one again after sweeping Hangtown. Can he hold on? Of course, in motocross, most anything can happen, as Wyndham found out in that first moto. Scott Sheik to the outside as the red bike. Team Honda getting into the action now. Ricky Carmichael, number 70. Track looks a lot different than it did in the first moto. They put some water on it here and there. It's a lot rougher. This kid signed a multi-year deal. Coming into his professional season, he might want to go renegotiate. <laughs> well, he's safe uh, to be three years. He knows he's got to ride for a while, no matter what happens. But I think the question there really is just the money. You know, he, here he, the last couple of nationals, and so far today, it looks like the fastest guy around. And uh, I don't think he's getting paid what the fastest guys are getting. So that may be a little bit of a problem. Cheek moving into third, getting around Decker in fourth. Decker doing a little slide right there. Sheik takes an unscheduled ride off the track. Decker gets him back. And Sheik having trouble getting through the barrier to get back on the track. Steve Lapson hoping to become a three-time consecutive 125 championship, which would tie the record set by Brock uh, Glover and Mark Barnett. Whoa, look at Wyndham. Cuts to the inside, trying to make up time. 
I don't know, maybe he's a little irritated with having to follow around that pack. You can see that Carmichael's getting away. He knows he can get up there and run with him, but look at this battle. He's trying to work around. Oh, Brock Sellers gets caught, hung up there on the corner. Wyndham almost goes off the track. Wyndham trying to battle back from a so-so start. Oh, Mikel Pichon is further behind now after going down. He's trying to restart that machine. He was a mid-pack when he went down, David, but he's going to be way back toward the end. Now you can tell by the way he's just covered with mud all over his right side. He went down hard right that muddy section there. Look at Wyndham over the double. Here comes Wyndham. Casey Johnson to the outside. Oh, Wyndham looked like you ran into him a little bit there. Wyndham goes down. Bad break for Kevin. Right now, Stefan Roncata, number 112, Honda of Troy Ryder, battling it out with Wyndham. He makes the move on Wyndham. I think maybe Kevin might have woke up on the wrong side of the bed today. Things are just getting worse. Now that crossbar pad's flapping around. David, I think you're absolutely correct about the depth of talent this year as compared to two years ago when Lammy was able to come back on Hughes. Well, if you're dominating out there and doing what Carmichael's doing, you'll get a huge points lead because everyone behind you is stealing points from each other, where uh, when Lampson made up all that time, uh, it was a little easier for him to go from about 18. Oh, Ferry goes down while challenging for second. Tim Ferry, a bad break. Looked like that front wheel just washed out on the turn, David. That's dropping away from you all the way down. That corner actually becomes more of an off camber, and there's some of those rocks there that may have gotten to berm and took his front wheel away from him. Here comes Wyndham down that treacherous hill. Look at the rebound that uh, Casey Johnson's having to put up with. That's tough. Right before you get to the corner, there's one more little spot where the hill drops off even steeper and a lot of breaking bumps have uh, developed there. Puts your back end up in the air and like I said before, it's hard to get stopped for that corner when your wheels are off the ground. Allie would be happy to see that he worked his way around Casey. He will not have to deal with him anymore. Next is Decker. Look at that line that Wyndham's got right there. What's happened is he didn't want to run in that deep rut. Everyone slides their foot through the corner and eventually your foot makes a new rut. He's using that for his berm. Pretty good line. Smart idea from Kevin Wyndham, who now is uh, on the move against Craig Decker. Wyndham with great speed. That's the exact same place that he tried to make that move on Casey Johnson, but... Decker eased up a little bit, yeah, maybe? Decker just backed off a little bit and gave him the line. I think Kevin had a little bit more on him that time than he had on Casey, but uh, either way, he makes the pass clean. He's still charging to the front. These guys chopping two seconds out of... Carmichael's lead. I think Wyndham's really the one pushing the pace right now. And if he can chop two seconds off in traffic, I'd be anxious to see what he can do once he gets past uh, Huffman, if he can, into the clear. Here comes one of Kevin Wyndham's favorite spots, and he makes the double. Gets in front of Huffman into second place. Amazing. Kevin Wyndham going from being snake bit to a confident, smooth rider moving into second place. Oh, Rainer was able to cut inside of the last turn on Decker. And he comes out of this turn cleanly in front of him. Watch him through here. He'll aim down to the inside. That's where Sheik was making his passes in the first moto. Casey will know he's there. Gets the good angle, but look at that. Casey puts the throttle down early. Oh, that was unbelievable. Beautiful Rainer. line. Beautiful. <laughs> he had no room right there. He just gas it went right around him in a line that no one's been using so far. Carmichael just the turn away. The chuckers for Ricky Carmichael. Number 70, Carmichael, flag. Of course, last year it was Jeremy McGrath with the great start, David. He had won all the motos through this round, the first six, and it was Jeff Emig playing catch up. They're off and running. Let's see who gets the whole shot. Henry, number 20, on the four stroke. Jeff Emig, right next to him there. Also Lusk, McGrath, Hughes getting good starts, but it's Henry up the hill in the lead. So they figured out. Oh, oh. going down is Ezra Lusk. Look at the lead here early that Doug Henry has on Jeff Emig. That thing almost sounds like it's not running right. The sound is so different. But believe me, he's put plenty of hours riding this bike. He's had so much testing time. He's very comfortable on it. Yamaha crew is telling us that uh, at times he's worked from 8 in the morning all the way to 6 o'clock at night. Four days in a row testing this machine. 
Here comes Emig on the outside. Doug Henry trying to hold on to the lead here with our first moto of 250s. Whoa, Doug Henry slowing up a bit. Emig takes the lead. Well, that was just a mistake right there by Henry that allowed Emig to get in there and take the line, make that pass. Doug went to the outside, which wasn't too bad of an idea. He had the lead on Emig. Coming right back, not going to let him off the hook yet, but made a mistake exiting that corner, wasn't able to get in the rut he needed. Right now, Henry's starting to put more pressure on Emig. It's obvious this four-stroke power is a great advantage, and Henry cuts to the inside, retaking the lead. One of the best battles we've had so far in the young season for first place. That was an aggressive move. Look at Henry just letting that bike dance all around. He didn't even get into that corner set yet. He already pitched it sideways, was right back on the gas, made that pass, I think Henry's gotta be going, geez. Henry had the inside line, looked like an easy time of it, but uh, Emig cut on a dime to make it close. Whoa, look at, look at the roost. First time I ever saw anyone ride a four-stroke was Mike Young, and it just blew my mind. I saw him in a race in Carlsbad, and he came around the first lap in a full lock slide through this whoop section, and just, didn't swap at all, and he pulled away and won there, and I was so impressed with how fast these guys went on those bikes, and now we're seeing Doug do it, and by the way, I want to wish Mike Young uh, well. He's, he was injured here not too long ago. Cutting to the inside, retaking the lead is Jeff Emig. Emig and Henry, a back and forth battle. That's McGrath in third. Listen to that four stroke. You can hear him coming down the hill, all that compression. Oh, oh. And going up the hill, bar to bar. Henry with a good drive around the bottom, had the horsepower going up the hill, but Emig just cut him off. Boy, coming down that hill. You've got to use braking, you've got to use good technique, more than speed, but look at this. Doug Henry now back on the throttle. Going to the outside. Oh, 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 what a great race for the fans. Emig still in first. Uh, they're wide open around that sweeper. That was smart for, for Emig to try to cut him off and just as smart for Henry to go, okay, well, I got him on the inside last time. Maybe he won't expect me to hold it wide open and pass him on the outside. Emig had just enough of a lead to control that line. They're pulling up on McGrath. Great riders are making a move toward third. There's Albertine cutting in front of Dow. Well, Albertine has is, is, uh, just been, well, look at that, around the outside, wide open. What a power move by Albertine. There's not much room down there. That's one of the most sketchy places on the racetrack, about like this downhill here to try to make a pass, and Alby, he's going for it. I don't think McGrath is 100%, uh, and you can see it right now. Those, that's the effects. So it's the difference between uh, having nothing wrong, having the confidence that Albertine just spoke of, and Jeremy. Jeremy is just not on his game right now, and the competition, just like we saw in the 125 class earlier, is just a little thicker now. Albertine moves into second place. Looks to me like right now, Jeremy's just trying to stay close to these guys. He knows it's going to be a long day. There's another 30-minute moto to come. And I think he's just trying to make sure that he can make it through the day with that foot. Tries to cut inside on Henry, makes the pass. But Henry might come back. Hold your hat. And the checkers, the winner of moto number one for the 250s, Jeff Emmy. He's on a hot streak. Well, the game is really up right now as the 32nd board is sideways, getting set for moto number two of the 250s. Can Jeff Emig do it again, keep that win streak alive? Let's see who gets the whole shot. On the inside, Buddy Antonez, number 19. There, Henry exited early into the hay bales. And it's Foss that's down in the center of the track. Out in front is Buddy Antonez, the arena cross champion. Jeremy McGrath taking the inside and goes through that, that huge rut to take second place. Good idea there, Antonez went wide. Didn't have quite enough of a lead to be able to go out and use that line. That's not a bad line to take, but you got Jeremy breathing down your neck. Might want to protect the inside. Here comes Albertine again to the inside. Albertine hesitating a little bit. He just passed John Dow to corner before, and Dow tries to come back on him. Albertine just puts the throttle down. 
and gets by for third place Buddy Antonez. Albertine really aggressive right now as he went over that tunnel jump there sat down in the air put his leg out just to make save a little bit more time be ready for the corner when he landed. Doubt of course a contender in the 125 East with two wins before a practice track injury took him out of the last three races back to the action now with Albertine guns it around the corner on McGrath. Whoa does a helicopter spin. There goes Dowd. There goes Antonez. By the time he gets up, there'll be 15 to 20 riders going by. Watch this. He stays leaned into the corner. And the berm kind of disappeared. He didn't have any more traction. Lucky he didn't get hit by Jeremy. But uh, he started into a full lock slide, and then it had nowhere to go but the high side. He went back the other way, and there was no chance for him to save that. Let's hope he's okay. Here's the big battle right now, and McGrath's got his hands full with John Dowd. This battle for second place. Dowdy to the inside. Good, strong move. His mechanic Wyatt Seals talking about breathing. Right now he's just trying to hang on. As look out, here's Mike LaRocco as well as Ezra Lusk. After going down early, Ezra Lusk is battling back and he has to avoid the accident of Mike LaRocco. Mike LaRocco ticking a hay bale. Here's another example of a rider riding that's not 100% coming back from injury. John Dowd. Who's just had a gutsy performance? He's a game fighter. Well, it's hard to believe that he's not 100% right now with the way he's riding. He just has some trouble with the hand still. Getting in on. Oh, oh no! Doubt he went down. He run it out. Boy, that's a tough place to keep your balance and. And now taking the energy to pick up your bike in that sandy soil, restart it as Lusk and Jeremy McGrath whiz by. And once again, John Dowd making another move on Jeremy McGrath. Jeremy just looks over and says, uh, good luck, pal. And now he's got his teammate LaRocco charging hard, so they just keep coming. Both of them former champions. Of course, Jeremy McGrath last year and the year before, Mike LaRocco. And Mike LaRocco moving in front of his Suzuki teammate. Here comes LaRocco to the outside. Can Dowd hold him off? No, good angle. Late break. Oh, well, that was beautiful. You could hear LaRocco just wide open around that sweeper. Knew that that would put him to the inside. Great pass on uh, Dowd, who really seems to be the, the fastest guy on the track. This moto I could change my thoughts around. Maybe it's LaRocco who's the one on the move. But Jeff Emig is certainly uh, making a statement here early for his second consecutive title. As long as he keeps having the success he's had so far, I mean, if he can win this one, it'll be five out of six. Look at Dowd, though. Cuts all the way across. Passes LaRocco right back. Kyle LaRocco sleeping there a little bit. Boy, John Dowd is really putting it to him as Mike LaRocco gets back. Our battle on the camera now is Jeremy McGrath and teammate Greg Albertine going back and forth in the battle for fourth place. Albertine, as incredible as it may seem, has come up from like 17th to challenge in the top five. And it looks right now he's going to go into fourth position, getting around Jeremy McGrath. Right here is where he loves to pour it on. Boy, just barely. He landed and just somehow landed in that berm. He come up over the top of that hill blind. He landed right in the right berm, was able to make that pass. Number plates all bent out to the side. He's coming into the corner where he crashed earlier. Albertine really starting to position himself to be a contender for the title. He's had a little bad luck here and there, but. Well, especially a Gator back. Got behind early in the first round. You look at uh, his performance at the, pad, at the last national in Hangtown, and then today, if he can make this move on Dowd to the inside, no problem. But that's the beauty of motocross. You start when you're young travel the world you get paid big dollars win these titles and then you get the rest of your life the checkered flag for Jeff Emmy Welcome to the 1997 125 and 250 GP at Fox Hills. For those of us that live on this side of the water, this is the big one. A double header. Everybody who is anybody is here today. 
brilliant sunshine, 40,000 spectators, and we're in for a great, great day. Just a quick final word from Dave Thorpe to his protege, Carl Nunn, riding for the catfinning Honda team, and they start coming down onto the line. The first man down there, number 25, on the Husky is Mr. Federici, and Puzar and Chiodi are already down there as well. 15-second board is up. This is the first heat. Fox Hills, and they're away they go. They've got a very, very fast right-hand corner. They go into the right-hander together. Puzar is there. Chiodi is there. Federici will certainly be there. Camelingo on the inside on the left of the screen at the moment. So they've gone away in a big, big hurry. Yamaha, TM, Husky, all of them there. Where is Dobby? Where is Nunn? Well, we're going to watch the race and have a look and see. Well, it's already the Husky. This man has done such a great job for the factory this year. Number 25 on the Husky. That's Federici, but Chiodi on the Yamaha. Yamahas have been incredibly strong. The Italians have been one, two, and three most weekends. And right now it's the Chiodi and Puzar duet all over again. Then it's Jorgensen on the cat spinning Honda. He's got Fanton right behind him. Then Jamie Dobb on the Suzuki. Then Carl Nunn on the second of the cat spinning machines. Nice to see young Carl Nunn up there. Number 100, Puzar on the TM machine, throwing away a tear off. Chiodi, you can see the Italian flags coming out. They've got three of them in this race and plenty of European supporters here today. Fox Hills, absolutely electric atmosphere. The best of British weather, and you don't get that too often. Jorgensen, Jorgensen together now with Carl Nunn. Well, this is nervous times. Not so nervous for the Yamaha factory people. They know that they're doing a great job in the 125 division. No problems for them. That's the man that really has done a great job for Husky. So it's the Italians, it's Chiodi and Puzar at the moment, but they know that Federici and Fanton never far behind. Fanton on the Kawasaki has done a very, very good job. Then it's Jorgensen again, and he's got his teammate. This is heart-stopping stuff for Dave Thorpe. He's got his two riders getting closer and closer. We've seen it in all sorts of Formula One in cars as well. That's nervous times when they get too close, but no nervous problems for Chiodi and the Yamaha. Very, very professional approach to racing. You see his pit crew around the circuit, very, very explicit pit instructions to Chiodi. He'll know exactly where Puzar is, and that's perhaps just a touch too close. Chiodi, a very, very professional rider. And Federici just comes back again. He seems to get his breath. Now they're prepared to knock handlebars all the way around the circuit. Look at the machine. He gets it way out of shape. Puzar says, hang on, let me just calm down again before... We're going to be lying on the track as well. So Federici has moved up on the Husky. Federici has gone to second. The flags are out. The spectators are having what a wonderful day. Fox Hills could not have looked better. Church Plant and John Hall have certainly have put in a lot of hours and a lot of work. But the checkered flag belongs to Yamaha and Chiodi. In second spot, it's going to be Federici on the Husky. And in third, Puzar on the TM machine. Well... Another GP heat over. Quick explanation from Puzo as to what happened. A broken gear lever, but on to the next event. 250s, and away they go. 250s out of the gate. Somebody got a terrible head shake. They turn right. Now the cavalcade is on. There's a KTM up front. Oh, and they've gone down. Well, we can see Tortelli's on the floor. We know that Voland has gone missing. But what we do know is that Everts is up front as well. Let's have a look right at the front of the pack. Number seven is... No, it's Everts to the front already. Stefan Everts, the reigning World 250 champion, has gone to the front. Marnie Befoots on the Johnson-sponsored. Uh, Suzuki has gone to second. Colin Dugmore, the tall South African, got a wonderful start. We'll pick up on him and see where he is. So, Pitbyra looking good. Easter Maria looking good. There's Colin Dugmore. And just behind him is Peter Ivan. And then on the Wiseco Honda, that's the flying mark eastward. And we have to keep saying it, he's just getting better and better in 97. But what can you say about this man up front? From Belgium, the current world champion, Stefan Everts, on the HRC Honda. He just can't do anything wrong. In practice, he looks superb. They told me at breakfast he's going to be a difficult man to beat. He loves the circuit. But there he is charging Mark Eastwood behind him. Mark Eastwood certainly holding his head up high in some very, very good company there. That's the Stefan Everts. He just looks so good and so relaxed. 
off to the States in a few weeks' time, and we'll see what he can do when he comes up against the Americans. In second spot at the moment, number two, but the winner at Fox Hills, first round of the 250, Stephen Everts takes the first heat, and I don't believe they're going to look at him today. On the Johnson Suzuki in second spot, Monik Befutz, and a great ride for third position, Pit Byra, the ever-popular German rider. And with that, straight back to the line for the second heat of the 125s. Out they come again. Well, this is going to be a whole different scene. We can see the Huskies in there. We can see number 11. We can see Jorgensen on the Honda in there. But who's it going to be? We've got a Kawasaki running up front at the moment. But he's got the whole pack. The best of Europe are behind him at the moment. Well, he certainly came out of the gate very, very quickly. But I think into the top gate, it's going to be Federici on the Husky that is going to be there. Yes, he is. Number 25, the very, very distinctive color and the riding style. Federici on the Husky goes to the front in heat number two at Fox Hills. Can you believe we've got a little bit of dust coming up already? They watered the track very, very well yesterday. But today, 80 degrees of heat in the UK. Wonderful weather. Look at the amount of spectators all the way around the circuit. And who's it going to be in heat number two? Federici has gone to the front. Chiodi has gone to second. But they know that there's other Italians in there. Where is Chiodi? Where is Camelingo? Where is Brian Jorgensen? He certainly won't hang around. These 125s have certainly given us some good racing in all the Grand Prix in 1997. The points have been very, very close. But it's the three charging Italians. And Yamaha right now is the dominant machine. And they really have turned in some very, very good results in the first batch of races. Brian Jorgensen trying to get up the leaderboard as well. This track magnificently prepared. Very, very rough. Some steep uphills, some steep downhills. Carl Nunn on the cat finning machine. He's had a good day and he's certainly got E for effort. He's tried very, very hard. That is Chiodi now getting much, much closer to Federici. Chiodi, of course, hoping to rack up some points with Vial being away due to injury. So he knows that they can bank a couple of points today because Vial will be right back. And I'm sure in the next round, he will be up there with the, the three Italians. They have just been unstoppable in 1997. But right now, it's all about Federici and Chiodi. Chiodi has made his move. Chiodi goes to the front yet again. He knows how valuable these points could be at the end of the season. So he's just got to keep them going. And Puzo wants to get into the frame as well. Federici now just starting to drop back a little way. And all of a sudden, Puzo has made a run. And he'll certainly get the motivation from the crowd. You'll see the flags coming out. Puzo, a very, very popular rider indeed. He's been in all sorts of classes. Back in the 125 class for 1997. Up that very, very steep hill they go. And he knows that he's got, got a draw deep on his reserves at the moment. Chiodi is starting to go away convincingly, but Puzar and Federici, their race is not over. These are valuable points that they could pick up with Vial being absent. So Puzar goes on the inside and he should have the better line. Yes, he does. He'll now keep it very, very tight. Close the door. Italian flags come out yet again. Well, the question is, can Puzar just stay ahead? Brian Jorgensen now. He certainly put in a very, very good showing under the watchful eye of Dave Thorpe. Jamie Dobb, very, very popular rider. Back from the States with a lot of support in the UK. Very, very popular rider indeed, as is Carl Nunn from Mildenhall. That's one of the youngsters that will certainly be flying the Union Jack for many years to come. A pity that Paul Malin is absent today. A couple of broken bones in his foot have kept Paul out. A big, big disappointment to the fans at Fox Hills. And, of course, to his sponsors, Cadbury Boost and Yamaha. But Paul certainly in a lot of pain with his foot this morning. He made every possible effort to ride, but it just wasn't going to be. So, Carl Nunn having to fly the flag at the moment alongside Jorgensen. And they've certainly put on a good, good showing for the crowd. And they'll be back next year. Well, another checkered flag goes to Chiodi. You can't fault that ride. In second spot, it's going to be Alessandra Puzo on the TM. And then in third spot, yet again, on number 25, there he comes, Federici on that incredible Husky. And those three will be on the podium yet again today. Well, will this man be on the podium? That's the question. Sebastian Tortelli, a disastrous first rate. He went from stone last to sixth, 
But now he's back in the middle of the pack. Can he pull out what everyone's come to Fox Hills to see? An Evers and Tortelli showdown. The gate's down, they'll swing to the right. Oh, Polly gets out of shape, big time. Marnie Befoot has gone to the front step and Evans has gone to second. Tortelli has gone to third. This is what they want to see. Can the young rider take on the Supremo? Stefan Evans has looked unstoppable. The crowd are on their feet. The first lap is underway. You can see that distinctive helmet. That is Stefan Evans. He has got Marnie Befoot behind him. He's got a lot. He's got 39 riders behind him. Oh. Well, they've got a lot of riders in there. Number one, Stefan Everts. Well, nice to see that he's back up front again, but Tortelli got a good start. So did Volan, so did Jockey Carlson. Jockey Carlson can certainly turn in with the best of them. Frederick Bolly is there. Well, this is gonna be a very, very different race. We can see Yves de Maria a long way down the circuit at the moment. That is the man that's doing all the damage in 1997. HRC, Honda mounted, and he really has given them a lot of a lot of coverage. Number 24 on the Oxbow Kawasaki, Sebastian Tortelli, but at the moment he's chasing Stefan Everts. He's on the gas, he's got Marnik Befoot behind him. Well, you've got to get up early in the morning to get Marnik Befoot behind you, I can assure you. This is the youngster that has set the Grand Prix circuit alight. The 125 world champion, the current 125 world champion, racing with the best in the world, and he may well go with Stefan. Oh, Colin Dugmore has come to a stop. Colin Dugmore on the Sir Holtz machine and Mark Eastwood has come to a stop. What a shame. Two of the most popular riders on the circuit. Stefan Evers knows that he's done enough. Stefan Evers has just looked so super smooth today. He looks back and he's saluting to the crowd already. He loves Fox Hills. Very complimentary about the circuit. He's in the money. He's on the podium. Stefan Evers, Honda, does it again. Second spot, can you believe Sebastian Tortelli Oxbar mounted, Yandekruet Kawasaki, a great ride from that youngster. And in third spot, the Johnson Suzuki of Moni Befoots. Next round of the 125 GPs, we move to Slovenia and the circuit at Maribor. Rated as perhaps one of the finest circuits on the GP calendar, Brian Jorgensen explains. Brian, what are you hoping for today? Yeah, I hope for a good result. Uh, didn't qualify so well last yesterday, and uh, but I think I have a good day today. I feel pretty good. I had some problem with my back uh, yesterday, but I took a lot of painkillers and seems to be over, so I hope for a good day. From there, we had the opportunity to catch up with the ascending star in Britain, Dobby. Jamie, any chance of a repeat of the uh, result in Austria today? Yeah, that's the plan. I mean, I just keep trying to give 100% and hopefully I can get off the start uh, in a decent position and pull my way through. If you don't make the start, it's pretty tough out there, I believe. Uh, I think it's better here for passing than other places. It's going to get real rough and uh, it's going to form more lines, so hopefully uh, I'll be okay. Then we spoke with Bob Moore, and he was still nursing a black eye from the previous week. Bob Moore racing today, but not really fit. No, I just, uh, it's my first race back. I had a, actually the first race back was in England, but I had a big fall there and kind of messed myself up. But no, I feel all right. It's just, you know, it's all the same. Just coming back, you know, getting the rhythm and having the conditioning to go 40 minutes. So, you know, I just got to start over again. On the track for you here today, is it a good track? Yeah, I like it. It's really technical. It's a very nice track. The ground's good and uh, should be making for some good racing for sure. Good luck today. Thanks. Thanks, Bob Moore. Kiko? Is it possible for two wins again today? <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's not easy. I won't win today because I want to go in the point to a championship. Uh, it's not, not easy. Well, a man of few words. That sums it all up in the 125 class. It's no easy. He's quite right. Down to the line they come. The man to beat, of course, is Chiodi. 
Puzo will be alongside him, so will Federici. Bob Moore, the ever-popular American, back on the line after all sorts of injuries. The 15-second board is up. They've got a long uphill, a very, very start, a very, very fast start straight here. Then they swing away up the hill. Somebody's in problem at the back of the circuit. Who's it going to be? There's not a lot of space there. Up the hill they go. We'll pick up number three has got through first. That's Frederick Vial, and of course he's come back from injury, so they're going to know that he's back on the patch. This is the man that they want to beat today. Chiodi, Federici and Puzar have picked up points in recent weeks, but Vial is back and flying the flag. Well, he's looking good. Camalingo's looking good. Here's the man on the Husky. Weekend after weekend, he just turns in a great job. Bob Moore having a very, very good ride at the moment. He really can turn it on when he has a good day. He's back from injury. Well, now they've got a lot of work to do. I see Carl Nunn in there as well, but he's away back. This is a magnificent circuit. Chiodi and Carl Nunn absolutely together. Puzar is there in the middle of the pack as well. Well, it's going to be a very, very different race. Camalingo is right there with, with uh, Frederick Vial. This is a circuit that all the riders rave about. They really say it is very, very good indeed. A retirement from number 27. That's Craig Prattley, and what a shame. His first Grand Prix since he's been back from a knee injury. But up front, he's back from an injury as well, but he's doing it all correctly. Vial looking very, very good at the moment. Camalingo charging. This man, I have to salute him every single weekend. That Husky is there. Federici doing what he does best, as does Bob Moore, the ever-popular American, charging again, nursing a black eye. But that doesn't worry him too much. He's had all sorts of injuries this year. But when he goes, he goes well. Puzar starting to move up the field. But can they catch the flying? Number three, Vial back and looking good. Often they come back from injury and they don't get onto the pace quickly enough. But Vial who was missing at Fox Hills, unfortunately. And he had to relinquish some points to the flying Chiodi, Puzar and Federici. But he's going to pick them back up today. Federici looking good still. Now they come charging through. Bob Moore still hounding and harassing all the way through the circuit. Now you can see why the riders rave about it. Wonderful view for the spectators. Carl Nunn on the cat spinning Honda machine. He's up there yet again. Only a youngster, 17 years of age. He's got many, many years in the 125 class. Regrettably, Paul Malin on the Yamaha. Cadbury Booth sponsored machine still missing. He certainly has had a 97 that he would like to forget. He's had some terrible injuries, came back and rode in the British Championships and put on a wonderful display, and in the last heat of the day had a terrible fall and damaged that foot very, very badly indeed. So, sad to see that Paul has had a torrid, torrid year, but he'll be back, as they always are. Nice to see now Dobby moving up as well. Jamie Dobb on the Suzuki there in the blue shirt and the yellow machine up the hill. It's a lot steeper than it looks on the TV screen. That's the man that wants the valuable points. That is Vial. And, of course, he's on that incredibly quick Yamaha. So is Chiodi. And, of course, if Paul was here today, Paul would be on the third of the very, very quick Yamaha machines that have been so dominant in 1997. Well, another lap completed at this magnificent Maribor circuit. As I say, when the riders rave about a track that you know it's got to be good. Bob Moore, he's managed to stay in the saddle, so that's good news for him. Certainly it'd be nice if he can pick up a couple of points over the weekend. Number 21, Carl Nunn, slotting in some more points as well. But Chiodi has got work to do. He started off a long way back, and he's got to come through the pack. He knows that when the checker flag comes down, they are very, very valuable points. Jamie Dobb has had a good ride here today, but it's still... The hard-charging Vial up front, and he's done it. He's come back from injury to take the first win of the day. That's nice for him. I think Camalingo is going to finish in second spot if he can stay in that position. And then the ever-charging fit charging Federici on the Husky will get third. Straight back to the line. There's no time for a breather. The gate drops. Down they go. That Kawasaki certainly comes out the gate very, very quickly indeed. He's got a very, very good starting method, but ran a little bit wide. Who is it going to be? Well, can you believe it's the Italian, it's the Yamaha, it's Chiodi. Well, can Vial close him down, close the gap in the overall point standings for the year? 
Vial knows that he's been out with injury. He's got to pick up some very, very valuable points. Chiodi has been electric, and there he is again. Chiodi is charging. Well, Camalingo's there yet again. So Camalingo is on the gas at the moment. Where is Puzar? Where is Federici? Well, Puzar's not too far down. We're looking for none. We're looking for Dobby. There he is, number 72. Better position at the moment, so he's a little bit further up the field. But as Chiodi is charging at the moment on the Yamaha, he's got the bit between his teeth. Number 25, Federici, absolutely circulates like an Omega watch on that Husky. Weekend after weekend, we travel the world watching that man, and he just slots them in. And certainly at the end of the year, he's got to be in the top three, that's for certain. Whether he can take the championship, he certainly deserves it out of consistency. He's ridden very, very hard. But when Chiodi has a good day, he's almost uncatchable. So Chiodi up front on the Yamaha. Into second spot at the moment is Federici on the Husky. Puzar, as ever, on the TM, chasing all the way around the circuit. The three of them have just been unstoppable. And, of course, Vial is back as well. And he is now the fourth man in the, uh, in the podium points. So who's it going to be at the end of the day? I don't know and you don't know. Camalingo certainly is doing the work. Where is Jorgensen? He's certainly not up there. Where is Dobby? Where is Carl Nunn? Those are the riders that they'll be waving the Union Jacks for. Those are the riders of the future. But right now, the Italians are just so dominant in 125 racing. And of course, they get a lot of support in the class. All the way up through their training, they do get a lot of youth support. Well, look at this now. All of a sudden, Federici says, let's have a look at the front. Chiodi is there, but we've seen it before from Federici. And with Puzar, come the last couple, couple of laps, they are quite happy to bang bars all the way around the circuit. Camelingo looking just a little bit weary. Let's have a look as they go through the trees. Look at the move. Federici on the right-hand side. Federici has gone to the front. The big husky. We call them big because they're always known as four strokes, but the Husky, the 125 machine of Federici has gone to the front. Chiodi has gone to second. Puzo has gone to third. Well, can he hang on to this? This would be good to see. Number 25 on the lime green stroke yellow machine. Husky is in front at the moment. Yamaha is in second. Then it's the TM of Alessandro Puzo. And how are they going to finish? And where are they going to be on the podium? Well, let's just have a look and see. Certainly Federici deserves it. Weekend after weekend, he tried at Fox Hills. He had problems on the last lap. Camalingo still running well. Can he pull off a win in Slovenia at this magnificent Maribor circuit? That would be good to see. Number 25, Federici on the Husky has gone to the front. Jamie Dobbs still battling and charging, but he's doing a good, good job at the moment. There is our race leader. He tells the crowd, don't worry about me. He can see the checkered flag already. The Husky is going to take the checkered flag. Chiodi is still charging. They're up on the foot pegs. Then is Puzar. Well, isn't that great stuff? Federici takes the win. Chiodi second, and Puzar goes to third. Well, with the 125s out of the way, we grab our passports yet again and we head for the Czech Republic to take up the 500 GP at the Janin Circuit. And what a way to start the day. Franco Rossi, have a look at this. Throttle stuck wide open in third gear. Well, he hit the ground big, big, big time. An awesome crash. Some terrible injuries, but he went on to tell the tale. Meanwhile, down on the gate, they were all preparing the, uh, the perfect gate. Kurt Nickel was there, and we spoke to Shane King. My goal is to finish twice on the podium, so uh, that's what I want to achieve today. And uh, yeah, if it's third, second, or first, I'm happy. I just want to score points and um, have two really good motos and um, yeah, have some good racing. Well, you heard from the voice of a world champion. Down to the line they go. Bartolini on number 72. He's on the incredibly 
fast new YZM 400 Yamaha, which has really stopped the traffic this year. Number 91, Kurt Nickel, flying the Union Jack and doing a great job. That's the man from Yamaha. Well, he should be smiling. They certainly got a winner on their hands at one in the States at the Indoor Supercross. But right now, it's all about the Czech Republic. This is the five. Oh, and they go down. A pile of riders has gone down. We can see Bartolini's down on the floor. Well, have a look at this in slow motion. Somebody moved right across to the, to the right. That seemed to get the whole pack moving, and they went down. Oh, pick up sticks. Look at this. Well, you're going to have to do the leopard crawl to get out of the race, and you don't need a 500 running over you either. To the front goes number six. Van Dorn has gone to the front. He's been followed by Martins. Well, Kurt Nickel up to third already. So that's a good move. Kurt Nickel has got away very, very nicely indeed. So he is moving up. Let's have a look. These are the thumpers at their best. There's number two. That's Joel Smets. These bikes just sound absolutely wonderful. Bartolini on the Yamaha. That's the new Yamaha that has really done so well in 1997. It's won a couple of outings already. And of course, it won at Las Vegas in the Supercross event as well. So a lot of smiles from Yamaha worldwide, I should imagine. Kurt Nickel on the charge. What can he do? Number three, that's Johansson that's up there as well. But at the moment, it's still Van Doorn doing the work up front. Kurt Nickel, a very, very popular 500 rider. He'll be across at Hawkston Park riding in the UK in weeks to come. And certainly the crowd are going to turn out to see this popular man on that very, very quick KTM machine. But at the moment, he's still got to chase Van Doorn. And they've got some work to do. Completely different riding style on the 500s. And I'm sure in 1998 there's going to be some surprise moves. And I think there's going to be a very, very popular class growing out of these new four strokes. All the top factories are rumoured to be following the, uh, the machine that Yamaha have produced. And there are four strokes coming from Japan for 1998. We've seen press releases already. Kawasaki, Suzuki and, of course, Honda. They will not yet let Yamaha steal a march on them, I'm not quite sure. The new Yamaha has been met with great, great success. And uh, a lot of people talking about that machine. And everyone's looking forward to seeing it in the UK at Hawkston Park in just a few weeks' time. And right now, you don't have to look any further than position number one, because that's where the YZM 400 is at the moment. First position, Peter Johansson doing a great, great job for the new revolutionary four-stroke machine. Revolutionary, of course, because we haven't seen them for a while. And he takes the checkered flag. Well, there will be some big, big smiles from the Yamaha people here. Up to the podium they go. Peter Johansson in the middle. He takes the race win. Second place on the Saholtz Honda will go to Van Dorn. And in third spot, and a very, very popular finish for Kurt Nickel on the big KTM. Down to the line we go again. Eyes down, look in. The gate drops away. They go. 500 motocross in the Czech Republic. At Janin, they hook down to the left. Who is it going to be? Wouldn't it be nice to see Kurt Nickel? Wouldn't it be nice to see Peter Johansson yet again? Well, this time out, it's 72 Bartolini. He's in second spot. He's got the Kawasaki in front of him. We saw Kawasaki go through in front, but the end of lap number one, Peter Johansson. He's followed at the moment by Joel Smets. Eckenbach is in there as well. These new Yamahas have just been a sensation this year. A lot of people looking forward to some interesting moves in the teams for next year. But right now, Kurt Nickel making a charge. Peter Johansson looking very, very good indeed. Eckenbach on the Kawasaki. He's done an excellent job. And then it's the second of the Yamahas, Bartolini, number 72. He will want to get past Eckenbach. Two completely different bikes to ride. Eckenbach on the two-stroke. 500 Kawasaki being hounded and harassed by Bartolini. Bartolini certainly has looked very, very good on that machine. Wonderful sound they make as they go away from us yet again. So Eckenbach and Bartolini charging. Can Peter Johansson pick up a second win for the day at Janin in the Czech Republic? Well, he's certainly looking very, very confident. The bike looks good, sounds good. They had some jetting problems earlier in the year. They brought out some of the heavies from Japan. They sorted that out very, very quickly with slides and jets and breathing problems. They got that correct. 
and the Yamahas have just gone from strength to strength. And of course, for 1998, they will go into production. The man in the street, we are told, can buy them for around four and a half thousand pounds. And really, the 500 class could come alive. The rest of the Japanese big four will all follow suit. And who will be riding in the 500 class next year? I wonder. So, Kurt Nickel at the moment doing everything right. Presently, we have Peter Johansson and Bartolini absolutely together. Well, we said earlier some smiles on the faces of the Yamaha factory man, the factory technical bosses across here, having a look at these guys today. And certainly a grin from ear to ear. Well, a mistake from Joel Smith. You don't see that too often. One of the strong men of the 500 class. So a win goes to Peter Johansson yet again. That's the man from Yamaha. And we had the chance to speak to Peter down on the line. Peter, you must be very happy today. Two wins, a bag full of points. What have you to say? This is the first time in my life I was winning two motors on the same day, so it's a perfect day. So on to Italy, San Marino, and back to the 250 GP. Can this man do it yet again? Stefan Evertz. Marnie Befoots, Johnson Suzuki mounted. He wants to get onto the leaderboard as well. But that's the youngster that still has a lot of work to do. Sebastian Tortelli looking better and better every weekend. And, of course, Talon Voland talking with his manager. He's got some work to do as well. Riding for Chesterfield Yamaha in 1997. He's had some big accidents. And some final preparations from the man with a screwdriver. And then it'll certainly be down to the line yet again. So Bob Moore giving some advice to his fellow American, Mike Brown. Frederick Bolly, have a look at that crash helmet. Isn't that magnificent? And then the ever popular Mark Eastwood grinning from ear to ear. And he's just getting better and better. Stefan Everts, well, Mr. Super Cool. And Talon Volan, what a shame. Not riding today. Made a decision after an injury at Fox Hills. He's going to have to spectate. And uh, that's a sad blow. So, the first heat of the uh, of the day at San Marino in Italy. Away they go. A magnificently prepared circuit. Who's going to get the whole shot? Well, can you believe it? Stefan Everts yet again. Stefan Everts this year has just been super, super confident on the HRC Honda. Look at the lead already. He's only into the second or third turn and he's going away. Yoki Carlson, that's nice to see on the RWJ Silkeline Honda. Very, very popular rider from the Colin Reed uh, from the Colin Reed stable, and then Tortelli moving up through the tra through the pack quite quickly as well. Marnie Befoot, he's too far down for his own good, so he's left himself a lot of work to do. Yoki Carlson and Sebastian Tortelli, well, that's heavy company to be, and I can assure you, this youngster Tortelli. We've said every weekend they race wheel to wheel. Tortelli goes onto the inside. On that Yonder Hurt machine, magnificently prepared by the master himself, the Dutchman that has done so much for motocross riders throughout the world, living in Holland. He worked for Albertain, he worked for so many riders, and he's now with, um, with Jackie Vimond putting in all the work to help this youngster, Sebastian Tortelli, the young French rider. He's moving up through the circuit. Whether he can catch the flying Stefan Everts, I don't know. So, San Marino in Italy, Mark Eastwood. He keeps saying he's getting better and better. His mind seems to be right. He is a confident youngster now, and he could certainly be on the podium if he puts in the work, continues to get the starts that he's had in recent weeks, he's getting a lot of help, and he has a lot of friends around the motocross fraternity. So good to see Mark Eastwood flying the Union Jack yet again. Pit Byra, that's the strong German. He's always there. So Marnie Befoots has got some work to do. So has Tortelli. Colin Dugmore. 28 years of age, riding for Seholz Honda, still turning them in weekend after weekend. He's certainly been at it a long time, but he says he's still getting the results and he still feels very, very good about his motocross riding. So that's a good enough reason for Colin to stay there. Tortelli has moved up to second. 
Can you believe the way that this 18-year-old handles this pressure every single weekend? He knows that he's got Byra behind him. He's got Everts in front of him. He's got so Yoki Carlson behind him. Now, that's the RWJ Silkaline Honda. They put in good results every single weekend as well. There's Mark Eastwood. He's having himself a good time. But uh, Marnie Buffett's just too strong at the moment in the closing stages of the racing. Yves de Maria as well. Well, there's serious company there. Colin Dugmore's in that company. Stefan Everts knows that he's done enough. He knows that he can keep, he can keep the hard-charging Tortelli behind him. Stefan Everts from his pits will know exactly where he is. Number seven, Pitbira is there as well. Yoki Carlson with only a couple of laps to go at the end of a very, very long and hard-charging San Marino Italian Grand Prix. Yves de Maria has not had the best of years so far. He's had some bad results. He's certainly capable of getting on the pace. But this is the man that's going to put some more points on the board today. Stefan Everts riding out of Belgium on the HRC-sponsored Honda machine. He certainly has given them a lot of support and been very, very good for Honda. But it's not over yet. Tortelli on the Yonder crew at Oxbow. Kawasaki still charges. He knows that if Everts makes a mistake, he can pick up valuable points. And then into third spot is now the German Pitbeira. Behind him, Jockey Carlson. And I'm sure Stefan Everts, as we look across, will be looking for the checkered flag. Marnie Befoots, we've got Yves de Maria now right behind him. They know that the race, uh, heat one of the race at San Marino is coming to an end. And Stefan Everts knows that just around the corner is what he's come here to do. That must surely be the last lap board for him. He'll know that Tortelli's behind him, and that's not always a good pit signal. But Stefan Everts is so professional. He just puts his head down. He does a job of work. The crowds will already be telling him that he's got it under control. Tortelli has had his last charge. I don't think there's enough race time left for Tortelli to do anything about it, except come back in race number two and see if he can change the results. So Yoki Carlson puts in a last charge. The circuit ground conditions here are very, very hard indeed. Dunlop hoping to test some new tyres in a couple of weeks' time. They're working on a new prototype. Uh, we spoke with uh, Jean-Pierre Lebay just a few weeks ago, and he said there was a new, very, very interesting Dunlop tyre to be launched into the motocross world. So Mike Brown from the US of A still doing some work. Mark Eastwood, number 22. He's just about done it all. But that is the man that certainly knows he's done enough He's not waving at the crowd just yet. He hasn't quite got it in the bag, but Stefan Everts and Honda, another victory. He really has had a very, very good year indeed. Talon Volan came out at the beginning of the year and gave him a good run for his money, had a couple of very, very nasty accidents to Talon and hasn't been able to come back and get back on the pace yet. So Stefan Everts is just starting to pull away now with the championship. People like Yves de Maria, Marnie Buffett, Pit Byra, just haven't had the consistency of Stefan Everts and he's starting to stamp his authority all over the 250 GP Championship for 1997. Stefan Everts, there he is. He knows he's done enough. Hand goes up, back on the podium. A win for Stefan Everts. A second for the Oxbow Kawasaki mounted Sebastian Tortelli. And into third spot, well, we'll have a look for the official result, but into third spot must surely be there he is, number seven, Pit Byra, a well-earned third position, and he's on the podium. Well, there's no time for champagne. They're going to be back to the line. Heat number two, a smiling Mark Eastwood. Colin Dugmore alongside in the popular South African. But that's the man that could well come back in heat number two. Stefan Everts with his new haircut and new hair colouring. Well, what can Tortelli do about this man, Everts? Well, down to the line comes the bike of Mike Brown. Mike has been very, very ill between heats, but his bike is on the line. That's good to see. Well, it could be a touch of food poisoning, so he's got some extra work to do. Heat number two, San Marino. Everts is the man to beat. Tortelli is the man that could do it, but the old fox, Stefan Everts, too clever. Well, look at this. This is Yves de Maria that goes to the front. 
Well, number four, Yves de Maria has got Everts behind him. Then behind him is Petvira. Well, Everts has gone to the front very, very quickly indeed. Where is the hard charging Tortelli? I thought he'd be there, but it's de Maria and Byra. I've seen Byra have a couple of rides that can stop the traffic. And when he gets strong, he can put in some amazing results. De Maria very, very capable as well. There's Tortelli. So Tortelli in either fourth or fifth position at the moment. We'll have a look at the lap score sheets when they've completed another lap. But Tortelli has got out of the gate well. He's certainly up there with the race leaders. So is Marnie Perfoots. So the second heat looks as if it's going to be a whole lot closer than the first. But it's all about this man that rides like a robot. Stefan Everts, 1996 current world champion on the HRC Honda. He's stuck with the bike when a lot of people condemned it. Everts said, leave it to me. I'll get it right. And he really has shown the GP world that the 250 Honda for 1997 is a race winner. Well, he's done a great job of work. So race number two, Everts is up front. Tortelli is charging and he's going to turn this into a very, very strong race indeed. Let's have a look as they go up the top of the circuit. All of a sudden, the Oxbow Kawasaki mounted Tortelli has picked up his pace. He goes inside. You don't phase out Everts too quickly. Look at the cheek of this young Frenchman. He wants to jump side by side. The crowd have responded and so has Stefan Everts. Tortelli has gone to the front. Listen to the hooters. Look for the tricklers. Sebastian Tortelli on the Kawasaki has gone to the front. But Everts, he's so super cool. He never looks to get out of shape. He never gets rattled. He just does the work. He doesn't do any change to his riding style. He doesn't become aggressive. He doesn't even look at block passing. He just keeps on the pace. Lap after lap, his pits will tell him what to do. That's where Everts is so super, super cool. Sebastian Tortelli on that very, very quick Yandergrad prepared machine has gone to the front. Stefan Everts has gone to second. De Murray has gone to third. Yogi Carlson has gone down to fourth. Isn't that good to see? Silkelin mounted RWJ Honda. Well, that's a very, very nice position for him to be in. Marnik Bafutz in on the Johnson Suzuki a little bit further back than we've expected him to be. Right up with the race leader to Stefan Everts because that's where he was for the whole of 1996. Well, he hasn't given up the chase yet. Sebastian Tortelli, what more can you say about this youngster? Weekend after weekend, he's just getting stronger and stronger. But of course, what he doesn't know is that behind him, Pitbira has moved to second. Stefan Everts has dropped the machine, which is very, very unusual, I might add. But he's got the bike up and he's going again. So Stefan Everts has gone to third. Pitbira has gone to second. Tortelli is still in front. He is flying the Kawasaki at the moment and he's doing an excellent job at the San Marino 250 GP. In fourth position is going to be Yogi Carlson and behind him now is Yves de Maria. Well, his pit crew will soon be telling him that he has one lap remaining. The question mark, of course, has he done enough work to take the win at the San Marino Grand Prix? We think so, but we've seen him do some funny things Late in the race, he seems to get tired. If his concentration goes for a second, it's all over. He certainly got the speed. And Stefan Everts is now back on the charge. Stefan Everts is now moving through very, very quickly indeed. We know that they've only got a lap remaining. Marnie Perfoot says, I've had enough for one day. I've done everything that I know how to do. But it's not good enough to get onto the tail of Everts. Tortelli knows that puts the front wheel up in the air. Another win for France. Another win for Oxbow and Kawasaki. Tortelli takes the race win. In the second spot will most certainly go the hard-charging Pitbira. Nice salute from him on the Honda. And then for third in the second heat, we'll wait and see who joins Sebastian on the podium. Well, Stefan Everts on the podium yet again. Sebastian, great race today. Tell me about the first and second moto. First moto was a little bit, you know, same than the second one, so I just had a crash on the f on the second one. But I have, I think, a good speed on the first one. That I do just a mistake with my front wheel, just slip away. 
So that's why a little bit the problem I have, but I think it's a little bit like I'm young for for right. So uh, I try to do my best and I push hard like I know. You had tremendous speed in the second moto. Did you make any different changes with the bike or tire test uh, different changes with the tires in the second moto? No, I just keep the, a little bit the same tires. I have some special one on the rear, special for the heart, just new from today. But I keep all one from the from the front, who I think was better on this condition today. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. So to Holland for the Dutch 500 GP, and we met up with a smiling Trampers Parker who had recently abandoned the Vermati team to link up with KTM. Well, some smiling faces there. Joel Smets first down onto the line with the big Huserberg, always immaculately prepared. The whole pits and the whole setup look really, really good, and he'll be joined by the reigning world champion from New Zealand, Shane King. Well, muddy conditions and grey, grey skies. But they're away for heat number one. Out of the gate they go. Can the flying Yamahas do it yet again? They have been sensational. Somebody goes down. Somebody has gone down on the inside of the turn. We'll pick it up on another camera later on. But right now, who is the man that has got out of the gate and going away at hell very, very quickly? But Daryl King has gone to the front. James Marsh is in behind. Daryl King's bike has come to a stop. Daryl King has stopped in the corner. That allows James Marsh to go to the front. And then I think Burnham is going to be there as well. Burnham is certainly there. Then we can see the lime green colours. That's the Huserberg. That's Joel Smets. So Joel Smets is now charging after Burnham. Well, look at the conditions on the circuit. If the rain doesn't come, it's going to be magnificent. But if any more water falls on the circuit here at Hal, it's going to be a quagmire. A very, very pretty circuit, very, very loamy, very, very soft sand, and for 500 territory this is fine, but if you get into that mud, you're going to need welly boots and a snorkel to get out of there. So Joel Smets now, this is what he loves best. Joel Smets on that big Huserberg, you take a handful. When it goes into the trees, you're going to hear the echo coming away from the circuit. Number 22 is in there as well. That's Trampers Parker, his first time out on the new KTM. Well, he must be enjoying that. Kurt Nickel is there as well. Number 91, KTMs everywhere. This is the Austrian factory that Heinz Kindergarten has done so much work in bringing alive around the world. We've seen them in all the big Paris Dakar type rallies. Heinz Kindergarten raced in 250s and 500 motocross for a long, long time. The baker from Austria, but right now, the KTMs are doing a great, great job, and so is Joel Smets on the Huserberg. So, the checkered flag to Joel Smets yet again, and oh, and the rain came down. Never mind the rain in Spain. Have a look at this, and surely heat number two is going to be cancelled. I just told him Huserberg is making uh, thumbs for the fire department in Sweden. Eh? Yeah. Like, oh, I can take my bike, put it upside down, and suck the water off the track. Eh? <laughs> 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 well, you heard from water pump Joel Smets himself. Heat number two has been cancelled and we leave Holland with only one heat. Second board is up, Davy Coombs. I think you're going to see a lot of things happen here in the first turn. It's going to be a, who gets out cleanly and who's left behind. We've seen it happen all night and the card is sideways. Could we have a different winner? We've had six different winners this year. Could we have a new points leader when this is over? Amig and McGrath. McGrath gets across the line, but look at number seven, Kevin Windham. Windham shoots out of there like out of a cannon. Yeah, Jeremy McGrath took Jeff Amig way deep into the hay bales and ended up screwing both of them up. I think Jeremy got into that first turn and he didn't want to get pushed out like he did in the heat, so he went a little too deep. That was a disaster for Jeff Amig. He went from second on the outside to about 15th. The fireworks, in case you want to know about the bombs going off, it's fireworks here at the Charlotte Motor Speedway on our first lap. Kevin Windham, and then 
Mike Craig. Mike Craig in second place with Ezra Luskin third. Larry Ward in fourth. It's Albertine and then Jeremy McGrath. After McGrath, it's Bradshaw, Kodrowski. Then it's Phil Lawrence. Boy, we have to go way back until we find a Jeff Emmy. Jeremy McGrath gets the clean bar to bar action now with uh, Albertine. I, I see Emig right now. He's only picked up two spots on that lap. He's only up to 12. He's getting ready to make a move on one of the Chaparral guys, but he's got a long way to go before he gets in the top three, let alone before he gets up to Jeremy McGrath. A five second lead for Wyndham on Craig. And then right behind him, Ezra Lusk. Jeremy McGrath has now moved behind Lusk. Well, right now, what, what Jeremy's probably doing is settle in. He's got an eye on all the top three guys. Now he can take his time. He knows he has 19 laps to do it, and that's a long time. So he might be thinking, hey, Kevin Windham can get tired. A lot can happen in that time. Number 15, Michael Craig, coming off the injured list after missing four races with a broken scapula. That's your angel wing, I think. But he's one of the riders, guys, I thought had a good chance for a win this season. Ezra Lusk takes Craig number 15 maybe a little bit of that time off paid uh, came back and haunted Craig right there he junked the landing off that little double that's all Ezra needed now we got Yamaha one and two and that's happened once earlier this year and the battle is on now but uh, right now Kevin Windham is out in front here is a replay though in the battle for second place it's Jeremy McGrath on the right Ezra Lusk on the left wheel to wheel not even a scratch of plastic though and now Ezra Lusk is kind of playing it like he did last week not let Jeremy get too far away, but he's not showing him any wheels. Okay, down to Marty. Yeah, when he came by, he was motioning something about being wrong with the bike. I'm standing here with Wyatt Seals. He's on the radio with Roger DeCosta. He can't talk to me right now. They're trying to figure out what's wrong also, but there is definitely something wrong with Jeremy Suzuki. He's got a flat tire. Looks like he might have the flat tire. Jeremy McGrath, oh, yep. what a break this would be. Yes, the rear tire. Yeah, Jeremy McGrath has got a rear flat tire. Well, it's a fairly straight track. If it were the front tire, it'd be impossible. Yeah, but with this high-speed track, as much as you're accelerating to jump triples and doubles and through the whoop de doos That's right, lots that of jumps. Yeah, you're going to throw that bike sideways. So we're, we're going to test his merit, but that's, that's the great thing about Supercross. There's a lot of time left, too. That thing might come off the rim lock, and he's going to have some real problems. Seven laps remaining for number one, Jeremy McGrath. Can he hold on as Emig has got to be inspired? A few seconds behind them, we got Ryan Hughes and Larry Ward coming up, too. Right there, we see Emig go by. Jeremy just salvaged the points lead, Art. That's right. Emig making his move. Emig started in 14th and has now moved 10 spots up. And number three, number one, it's Jeff Emig. Well, I think, you know, Jeremy is a champion. He's going to keep fighting. Now, the key is going to be Ryan Hughes and uh, Larry Ward. If they get by him, that's going to put a little bit of a chunk in there for the last race. So, you know, last couple races. So, right now, Jer Jeremy's got to be getting eat up right now because I've been through that. I lost a spring in 82, and that added to me losing the championship. Here's the horseshoe. Coming up the checkered flag. A Yamaha 1-2. That's a fact. Here's Kevin Windham. His first 250 Supercross victory. Ezra Lusk in second place. And here comes Mike LaRocco on Jeremy McGrath. We got uh, half a lap to go. He can still make the pass on him, but now is he going to be a team player or is he just going to go out for himself and uh, try, to, try to take those points away? Team Yamaha. Look at Kevin Windham shaking his head. Probably exhausted after his own teammate pushed him to the limit. Well, when you get pushed like that, you, you have to reset, step it up on the last lap. It makes it tough. But here we got Jeremy McGrath, the champion that he is. Just keep fighting and keeps digging. And he's holding, he's holding off uh, Mike LaRocco. Jeremy McGrath, an unfortunate situation right now. It'll be interesting when we see the official standings. I think, this, I think that uh, this is great. Mike LaRocco is being a team player. He's not pushing it. You know, even though there was the controversy there, he's still, that makes him a, sh a great champion. We'll be back with the official order of things and the celebration here from the Charlotte Motor Speedway after this. From Texas Stadium, the home of the Cowboys, it's round 14 of the AMA Four Parts Unlimited Supercross Series. Okay, Jeremy McGrath has got a Honda of Troy Rider. Larry Ward right next to him. And the Kawasaki 
of Ryan Hughes on the other side. We're off for the main event. Jeff Hemming, number three. Home. Jeremy is Jeremy's caught down. Jam. He's caught up in the first turn. There's Antonio's number 19. Number five as well is caught up in the, into the mess. That's uh, LaRocco. And over to the outside, Damon Huffman is stuck underneath his motorcycle. It's hard to tell if he was injured, if he just couldn't get up by himself because the bike was on top of him. But emig has got clear sailing, and Jeremy's buried in the pack. What an opportunity here. Well, Jeremy just moving out of 13th place. It takes us back to 1995 in the mud race then. He was in 13th, got into fourth by lap seven, and ended up in second place. Can he do it again? I tell you, you know, he's capable of doing it, but the one thing is, is you got Jeff out front, and if he doesn't fall down or uh, make a mistake, I mean, make enough to look like about 20, 20 seconds right about now, it's going to be tough. That would still give Emig a nine-point lead going into the final race of the year. That's Jeff one, Emig. That's one place you don't want to be is nine points down going into the last race. Great, <laughs> great place for Jeff. Yeah. Terrible place for Jeremy. That's horrible. He's been coming from behind a lot. He's had three opportunities with Jeff not on his game to, to gain those points back and a fall in Michigan, a flat tire in Charlotte. It really kept him from taking over the series lead. He's gotten around Lusk. As Kotrowski finally gets his break and so does Bradshaw. Both these guys having a tough time through the heat and semis. Actually Bradshaw more so and finally got a good start in the main. Look at this, Ryan Hughes pulling up on the back bumper. It's kind of interesting that Ryan would go out and kind of pressure uh, Jeff like that. If I was Jeff, I'd almost be willing to just let him go. Go ahead, go ahead, go win the thing. I'm going to stay here in second and try to capitalize on Jeremy's uh, bad start. Hughes has gone down. Well, that's going to help. And as it starts to rain with 11 laps to go, this track can deteriorate pretty quick. Guys uh, getting caught by surprise here and there by the track getting slick if it, if it keeps raining hard. Well, what a ride for Kudrowski as he moves into second place. That's the significance when number nine went down. He's right behind number 18, Jimmy Button right now. Button moved up to third. So Hughes rejoins the action in fourth ahead of Craig. The only battle on the track is right here. Mike Kudrowski in second place is being hounded by Ryan Hughes, number nine. Hughes trying for his best finish of the year as they both blow by Buddy Antonez the Leopard. Look at the power, Jeremy just pulling it up, cinching it up as he tries to approach Jimmy Button. Probably one of the best times uh, for Jeremy going through that section that last lap. Uh, he needs he needs to get around Jimmy right now so he can try to concentrate on Michael Craig. He's got it. A couple more points. Look at that nice move by Jeff Emmick, cutting through the lappers with ease, pointing to his friends as he goes. He's coming around to that triple he's been doing. The only other guy that tried it was Hughes, came up a little short. Look at the people waiting. <laughs> this could be Jeff Emig's finest win. I know St. Louis was significant because it, it broke up that tremendous win streak. Just a stepping stone to where he's at now. The checkers for Jeff Emig. season is underway for the 250s. It is Jeremy McGrath on the inside. Emig to the outside. McGrath is tied up in turn one. McGrath went down again. What a battle. Jeremy McGrath takes this first lead of the season. Jeremy McGrath spun out and Emig is now in first place. Jeff Emig takes round number three. Here he comes with the big race on. Trying to get around Jeff Emig. Seals him off. Jeff Hemming, a good bang bang performance. And here's the checkered flag. Jeremy McGrath, his 44th career Supercross win. Jeremy McGrath, his second win of the year. McGrath is down and he's under the bike. Lutz takes the lead. Looks like he might have the flat tire. Jeremy McGrath, oh, what a break this would be. Yes, the rear tire. Oh, Jeremy is down. Again. He's caught up in the first turn. The checkers for Jeff Emig. Oh my goodness, Jeff Emig.
everybody from Sam Point Stadium, the home of the running Rebels of UNLV. It's the final round of the 1997 Supercross season. The Suzuki Point standings tell us that Emig's 13-point lead gives him that luxury of needing only a ninth or better to win his first Supercross championship. Luskin third, Ward, the top non-factory rider. Albertine not racing tonight because of injury will drop out of the top five, but likely Larocco might move up. Seven different winners this year. Twelve different riders made the podium. Eleven different riders have led laps this season. We've had the most first-time winners, a tying record of four. We've had the most riders winning more than one Supercross in a single season. That ties that record with four. It's been an unbelievable year. Jeff Emmy gets ready. We're underway. The final race of the season. Henry makes the thousand bucks one 900 pro race hole shot award right there number three is emig with bradshaw alongside hughes is behind him with jimmy button and larry ward i don't believe as one rider having trouble get to the first corner just one guy didn't get through there he gets slid to the outside but i am amazed at how well emig came out through that first corner because he had several guys at the inside of him easily could have pushed him off the racetrack jeremy mcgrath has already passed larry ward and jimmy button He's moved into fifth spot right now, or he's challenging for fifth against Craig. Henry is out in front. Bradshaw and Emig behind him. Emig moves into second place with a good box out like move. The block pass for Emig. Hughes is coming up on Bradshaw in third. Looks like Henry is just going to say, see you later. He's already got a big lead in the battle. It's a three-way battle for second right now, including Bradshaw. Jeremy sits right behind that, and if he wants a title bad enough, he's got to go in there and mess with Jeremy a little bit. I mean, mess with uh, Jeff Emick. That's what Rick Johnson would have done back in our days. He'd take me out if he could. You never know. It's not over till it's over. If Jeff was to make a big mistake, if something really wacky was to happen to the motorcycle, and... I don't even want to think it, but I think it's possible. And at this point, that's all prayer Jeremy has. Mike Craig, fans, he got a good start, but he went down shortly. There's the move. Ryan Hughes in front of Emmy. The position really doesn't matter to Emmy. He wants to just stay out of trouble. And if later in the race that position didn't make a difference, you can bet the signal board would come out for Hughes, let him by, and he'd do it. Ryan Hughes, Jeff Emmy, and Damon Bradshaw. But right now, Jeremy McGrath is four seconds behind that group. Bradshaw, he's trying his move on Emig. Emig doesn't want to let it go. He looks back at him. Bradshaw moves cleanly up a spot. Now what this sets up is that, yeah, Emig didn't need to hold these guys off, but now the next guy in line is Jeremy. Vegas has been very good to Yamaha. And Jimmy Button, Button goes, down. goes down. Team that Chaparral's Button. That whoop section right there, those last three or four bumps, that's where Carmichael went down. Number nine, Ryan Hughes. He's in second place with Bradshaw in third. That's really... White flag lap. Final lap of the final race of the season. Will this be the first Supercross title for Kawasaki since 1987 when Jeff Ward took the title? This is a long lap for Jeff Emig. He's, he's soaking it all up, though. There's his mechanic. It's a great feeling for these guys. For the first time in five years, someone other than McGrath will reign as Supercross champion, a former teammate of Doug Henry's number 20. Doug with that fin on his helmet. Troy Lee concoction. A lot of the riders are using them. I think Damon Huffman has one. McGrath had one at the first round at L.A. Keeps them straight out there when they get up to top speed. Fifth spot, Jeff Emig, Jerry Albrick, his mechanic, waiting for him to come around. It's got payday written on it, and the crowd is standing, giving Doug Henry a great cheer as he takes the checkers for the third time of the 1997 season. And here is your new champion, finishing his final lap as the fireworks go off here in Las Vegas. The City of Lights light it up for Jeff Emig and Doug Henry. Payday, champ. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, Jeremy Albright gets a little bonus out of that, too. Here he comes across slowly but effectively. Jeff Emig, who is just going step by step on a marvelous career.
Every round of the 97 USA Supercross Championship. 100 minutes of action per round, and it's available from Motivision. Multi Air, the choice of HRC Honda Team RWJ. Multi-Air helped Yoki Carlson battle through the dust of Portugal to win. Multi-Air Filters. <laughs> <laughs> 